So we have been in a series, and um, I, I almost called it a new series. This is week nine. <laughs> and we're going to be here for a while because these are core understandings of who we are in Christ, who we are as Christians. And uh, so today we're going to kind of paint a picture of where we're going because we have been building a foundation to our better story. If I were to ask you what is your story, you might start out by saying, well, I was born here, or I was raised here, or I went to school here. And you kind of walk through it. But as we look at the scriptures, the Bible tells us that when we come to Christ and Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we are made new. We are a new creation. And, and so the old things have passed away. The new things become new. And, and, and so the question then begins, well, uh, man, there's, I, I'm not seeing that much change. Something in my life is just not quite in sync with those statements. Jesus says himself. He says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundant. Well, if you look at life and the life that you have been handed, it may not look so abundant. Maybe you're struggling with sin on a regular basis, and you're trying to say, well, how come if I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, why is it that I keep sinning? And we've been unpacking what all of this means and how we relate to, to Christ, how we relate to our sin nature and all these, uh, all these different elements as, as Christ follows, what it looks like. And so we've been building a foundation for the better story that God has for your life. The fact is, is God offers a better story, but we don't experience that better story because we're too busy living out of our wounded soul, our damaged goods, if you will, from the life before Christ. Or maybe damage is caused by life on a daily basis. We're so busy living out of the woundedness that we never learn to walk in the Spirit as God intends for us to walk in the Spirit. So we've been unpacking this. This is the foundation for our better story. And uh, Jennifer actually had a great idea. I was talking to her about the sermon and where we're going this weekend. She says, it almost like you're, she told me, it's almost like you're building a stage for now we're going to begin building our better story. And I thought, you know what? We've been building the foundation. Now it's time to start building our better story. And so that's kind of where we're going to head today. We're going to give you kind of a big picture of where we're going as a church in, in, a, in a study. But next week, we kick off March, which is going to be our missions focus emphasis. And so we're not going to be speaking on this. In fact, uh, we're hoping um, to bring in missionaries each Sunday. Right now, I think we have three Sundays booked. But our goal is let's just see where our missions are going, our missions money and all our emphasis. And there's not just opportunities to write checks to these, these different places of ministry, but there's opportunities to get involved. And so we're going to encourage you to be part of the missions month with us and to see where God is uh, moving and working. But so I wanted to give you kind of a big picture of where we're at and where we're going. Now, this was part of last week's uh, sermon, right? And you guys have learned that as we've been in the study, we start out, and I just tell you up front, we're not going to finish the notes. Yeah, you're right? A good story is not one to be rushed. You would never go to the library and buy a book and start reading in chapter 7. You would have no clue what's going on. And so we're taking our time working through the story that God has for us. So let me give you a recap from last week. Last week, we, we began to understand that until we grasp the fundamentals of who we are in Christ and walking in the fullness of Christ becomes extremely difficult. Until we understand the fundamentals of who we are in Christ, it's going to be extremely hard to walk in the fullness of Christ. Extremely hard to walk according to the Scriptures. Extremely hard to walk in this newness of life. It's going to be extremely hard. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit teaches us today. Father, thank you that we can be here. You have sent your Holy Spirit. So we ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher this morning. Father, for the things that we are covering in this study, they are hard things because we have to unlearn some of our churchiness, some of those things that tradition has taught us. Maybe not on purpose, but Father, we still carry them around and we think them to be truth and they're not. Lord, teach us, grow us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. My spirit needs a Savior. My soul needs a Lord. Now, I get it. We talked about this last week. We need a Lord and Savior, yes. But it, just as a mechanic begins to break our engine down before he starts working on that problem, he has to understand how everything operates and kind of the purpose and, and, and the different pieces and, and what it is they do. And so that's been the goal of our study. So our spirit needs a Savior. Our soul needs a Lord. And I get it. We need a Lord and Savior as a whole, but they, they operate in different capacities. And we, we looked at this last week. If, you, if you're right now sitting there thinking, huh, 
go back and watch the sermon last week. This whole sermon series builds upon itself. If you're not following us, if you're missing a Sunday service, you're missing kind of the teachings, all of these teachings, just like Legos, they stack upon one another. If you miss one, you're missing part of your story, and I don't want you to miss that. My spirit needs a Savior. My soul needs a little. We unpacked that last week. For him... To be my Savior, I have accepted Christ. I have I, I believed and now declare the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we looked at this in a much deeper level last several weeks. Through Christ's payment, he now offers us a gift, the gift of salvation, forgiveness. He literally, on the cross of Calvary, put our sin nature to death and removed it for those of us who put our faith and trust in him. We then have been set free to walk in newness of life and, and to walk in in the Spirit of God. And, and, and I know I just packed a whole bunch in that statement. You've got to go back and watch it and see where it is we've been and what we've been talking about. For him to be my Lord means that he is my comforter, my healer, and my director. Now, why do I keep sitting? Here's why. Because we continue to rebound back to our brokenness, our wounded soul. And because I'm living out of my woundedness, because of the way I was raised and I'm going to treat people this way, and because this thing happened at work, then I'm going to, to take some shortcuts over here to try to climb the ladder. And, and because of maybe a, a woundedness or something that maybe some besetting sins that took root in my life as a child, now as an adult I still struggle. All of that comes from the woundedness, the brokenness within us. And so why do we keep sinning? Because we keep reverting back to living out of our brokenness, not out of the Spirit as we are called to walk in the Spirit. And we've been unpacking that in a much deeper level. I'm not going to go back into all of that today. Please go back and watch the services. For him to be my Lord, he is my comforter, my healer, and director. Last week we saw that my behavior does not determine who I am. My behavior does not determine who I am. See, you have been taught your entire life how to behave. I'm just as guilty, I have children. That behavior is unacceptable, right? Romans chapter 7, verse 6. But now we have been delivered from the law, the do's and the don'ts. Having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit, that's a capital Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and not the oldness of the letter. He's speaking of the Old Testament law. The, this was the foundation of the checklist Christianity that we talk about often. This is the foundation of the do's and the don'ts, the, the, the rules and the regulations, all Old Testament. We are now under a new covenant. Jesus Christ has died on the cross, made payment for our sins. And literally, when you come to Christ as your Lord and Savior, your sin nature that rules and reigns is put to death. The do's and don'ts. That's Old Testament thinking. We must get this because when I understand who I am in Christ, I no longer worry about the rules or my behavior because I I am in Christ. It doesn't mean I'm footloose and fancy free. It doesn't mean I can just run around and do whatever I want. What it means is this. When I am in Christ, I don't have any other reason to be anything other than who God created me to be. I don't have to live out of my woundedness any longer. I don't have to live out of my hurts and my past. I don't have to be the victim Man, have you ever met somebody with a victim mentality? How long do you want to hang out with them? You are not the victim. Christ calls you victorious. So why don't we live that way? Here's why. Because we choose to lose, live out of the woundedness, the past. When I am in Christ, I don't have to worry because I have no other reason to be anything other than God who created me to be. I'm going to love the things that Jesus loves, and my heart will be broken over the things that breaks the, his heart, because I am in him, and he is in me. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to, and to do for his good pleasure. Who is doing the doing? God. Why do we have to do all the do's? 
Tradition. For it is God who works in you both to, do, to, to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. I don't know about you, but there's times it's really hard not to complain, right? But when I'm walking in the Spirit, he can help me not be a complainer. How many of y'all like to be around complainers? Negative people? Man, when they walk in the door, you just want to, like, <laughs> I need to go to my room for a reason. <laughs> I'm leaving the room. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. This is not a thing that we do. The life we are instructed to live is a byproduct, a byproduct. This is God who works in me, the verse says. It's a byproduct of being in Christ. My behavior doesn't determine who I am. Who I am in Christ determines my behavior. Why can't I get it right? Because you're trying to do it on your own. But if you will walk in the Spirit, if you'll choose the ways of the Lord and walk in the Spirit, yeah, there's going to be a struggle. But you will walk in Christ. It's not about the rules and regulations. It's not about the do's and the don'ts. If you will let the Holy Spirit lead and guide you and you will walk in the Spirit, everything else aligns. Everything else aligns. See, when I finally understand that it is not my behavior, it is no longer out of performance, when I understand these things, I start living out of who Christ created me to be. If I am saved, I am made new. My sin nature does not rule me any longer. My sin nature has been cut out and put to death. I am complete in Christ. There's just something wrong and I can't put my finger on it. No, you are complete in Christ. What is wrong is this. You're stuck over here. When we walk in the Spirit, healing can come. We've talked about this. In life, we have all these issues. My daddy did this. My mommy did this. The little kid on the playground said I was ugly. We have all these wounds we pick up and we carry our entire lives. They cause all this anxiety and all this fear and all this stuff. It messes us up. I've often said it. My children are going to need professional counseling when they're adults. Because they had me as a father. Right? But when we let the Holy Spirit work in our lives, when he rules and he reigns and we choose to walk in the Spirit and not of being a victim, God brings healing. What's my problem? Well, got to unpack some hurts. Got to unpack some wounds. As you are therefore, this is Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Verse 9 now, for in him dwells all. Does it say some? No, all. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete. Complete in him. Who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. That is the killing, the removal of the sin nature. By the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism in which... You also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. What does all trespasses mean? All sins, past, present, future having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he, was taken it, and, and, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Why do I keep sinning? Because I've got wounds. And when I'm sinning, I'm living out of that wounded soul. What about a besetting sin? It's often because we attempt to address the issue of that besetting sin out of our own strength, our own doing, 
instead of going to the Holy Spirit and Father, Father, help teach me. Why is it that I keep doing this thing? And having that conversation with God and letting God point some things out and and bringing other brothers and sisters in your life and letting them point some things out. And by the way, that is hard. That's why the Bible says we're supposed to confess our faults to one another. Do you know why? Because sometimes we need someone to audibly say, dude, you're messed up. You need help. We need someone picking up the phone or coming over and talking to face to face and say, hey, have you done this? We don't like accountability, do we? That requires someone pointing something out in our lives. I'll tell you what, that is the path to healing. You want healing? Really? Allow people in. That brings us to our sermon today. I've given you three columns column one, column two, column three. I could do them backwards because there are no more rules, right? But it might mess me up, so I'm not going to do that. Now, we're going to pack all of this in a much deeper level than just today. So please, if you you have questions, come ask me, but understand we're going to go much deeper. We need to understand that God, God is for me. God is for me. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are all killed, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us us have you ever felt alone you're not alone verse 38 for i am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor heights nor depths nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of god which is in christ jesus our lord see god is for me But God is also in me. First John chapter four, verse 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believe that the love that God has for us, that God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment but he who fears has not been made perfect in love i have been crucified in christ it is no longer i who live but christ lives in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by faith in the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me. See, God is in me. God is for me. God is in me. But God is also with me. God is also with me. Jesus said it this way 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy, Ghost, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, ready? I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. He says, hey, I'm getting ready to send you out. You're going to go do this ministry and, and understand something. I am always with you. Always with you. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You see, when I begin to understand that God is for me, he is in me, he is with me, things begin to change. When life happens, circumstances take place, it shouldn't change who I am and how I respond. Why? Because I have God. And when I walk in the Spirit, life around me shouldn't have to affect that. Because this never changes. There are people, possibly even here today, who have never believed that anyone is for you. Maybe you've had a rough life. Maybe it seems like the life is always bent against you. Understand this. You have a father who is for you. We all have a heavenly father who is for us. How committed is God the Father to you? Well, it's simply found in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. Gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be. You have a heavenly father who is for you. And he was willing to pay the ultimate price to save you in sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you, to make payment for the sins of mankind. We have a father. Who is for you. you now, we often project the shortcomings of mankind onto our Heavenly Father. Like, we, we think that our Heavenly Father responds to us in the way that others respond to us. For example, have you ever done something that disappointed somebody? And maybe that person is disappointed, they react, they respond, right? I've shared with you before, I grew, up in a, I grew up thinking that as a teenager, if I messed up, like I had an angry God in heaven just waiting to strike me dead. Why? Because in life I saw a lot of anger. And so I projected that on my heavenly father. Understand this about your heavenly father. He is perfect, he is just, he is righteous, but he's also a loving caring heavenly father and so it's it, it's, a, it's a mistake for us to to project our earthly understanding of who our fathers are or, or who our, our points of authority are in our lives and, and maybe their failures it's a mistake for us to project that on the heavenly father because he is for you he is for you romans chapter 5 verse 10 says this for if when we were enemies well how would you define an enemy in life somebody who you love right Someone you want the best for? Well, that's how we would protect it sometimes. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now that sounds to me like an evil, angry God, yes? No. Your heavenly father loved you even when you were his enemy. Loved you enough to send his son to make payment for your sins. Listen, we're unworthy. But yet God in his great love said, oh, but you are. Because I love you that much. So why is it that we project the failures and the ways that people respond to our failures on a holy God? Why? Because we're stuck in Old Testament thinking. 
What did God do when people messed up? Well, at one point, he destroyed an entire city. He must do that now. Well, no, 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 no. Different covenant. Different rules. The do's and don'ts are gone. Your behavior doesn't control you anymore. Who you are in Christ controls your behavior. See, God's love is not based on your actions. Not based on my actions. Who we are in Christ dictates who we are. I am loved. I am redeemed. Listen, I am forgiven. I am forgiven. And we mistakenly tie human reaction and failures and flaws and shortcomings and, and how, to how we assume that God is going to respond to us. We assume that he is happier with us at times when our behavior is better than others. That is not a biblical concept. We reject works-based salvation, yes? We reject work-based salvation, but in our lists of do's and don'ts, rules and regulations, we embrace a works-based love and acceptance and approval of God. Do we not see a problem with this? We reject works-based salvation, but we add works to everything else about God. Why? Because our thinking is skewed. There are two things that are really hard for every one of us in this room. One, to admit we're wrong. And two, to admit we're hurt. Here's the problem. This works-based approval from God has been taught to us from the time we were little kids. In our churches, from our pulpits, it's not a biblical concept of who God is. Because if it were, then that pastor would say, when we were enemies of God, he would strike us dead. Instead, he offered grace and mercy, grace and mercy that we'll never be able to comprehend or fathom. That is who God is. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Because your soul has been so hurt and wounded, dismissed, rejected, Life is full of fear, worry, anxiety, and pride. And listen, some of us are just coming to the point when we realize that we have a Father who is for us, but we also have a Son. Now, we've looked at this way early in our study. We were once an Adam, born in condemnation. How many sins must you commit to be a sinner? Zero. The Bible says we are born into condemnation. That is why Jesus was sent by his Father. So the Son, we were once in Adam, but now we are in Christ through his Son. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Galatians 3.26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. We have the Son. Here's what the Son tells us. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the, uh, in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Why do we keep sinning? Because we're not abiding in Christ. We're living out of our brokenness. You want to see fruit in your life? You want to see victory in your life? Live according to the Son. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you. Choose God. You have a choice still. Choose to walk in the Spirit. And listen, according to Galatians, it's going to be a struggle sometimes. I really want to do that, but I know this is what honors God. Uh, but, uh, 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 uh. You know the struggle? We've all been there, yes? We've been given the Son. 
And I'm sure all of you figured this out. The Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Romans chapter 8, verse 8. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There are a lot of people who still have not accepted Jesus Christ, but they're trying to do a whole lot of good stuff to please God. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. A lot of doers out there. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. A pastor friend of mine, he says it this way. We are no longer human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. When we walk in the flesh, we walk in the Spirit. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells, listen, in you we were spiritually dead ruled by our sin nature when we put our faith in jesus christ that sin nature was put to death on the cross of calvary and we were brought to life for the very first time spiritual life john 14 15 if you love me keep my commandments and i will pray the father will and he will give you another helper that he may abide in you for with you forever Verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be with in or will be in you. We have the Holy Spirit. So we know that God is for me. We have the father who loved us and sent a son. We know that God is in me, the Son has been sent and, and now lives in me. We also have the Spirit, or God is with us. The Holy Spirit is always with us. Why does this pattern exist? Because we serve a triune God. It's brilliant, God. It's like He knows stuff. Why am I having trouble writing this? God is for me. The Father has sent the Son so that I can be forgiven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Listen, we were condemned. But that the world through him might be saved. How are we saved? Through forgiveness of our sins. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross at Calvary. His blood debt paid for our sins. We run around the world trying to have an identity. Our clothing, maybe ident make is we, we base on our clothing, maybe we base on our looks, maybe based on our grades, maybe based on how people treat us or the approval of others. We have an identity crisis in our nation. Is it boys or girls? We have a crisis. Because everyone is looking for some kind of acceptance, approval. 
But when we learn that our identity is built on Jesus Christ, we can stop running around like a chicken with our head cut off. Because we know what truth is. See, our identity comes from who we are in Christ. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Remember God doing, the do, the, do, doing stuff through us? He's got a whole plan for us. You don't need to figure out what your identity is. Your identity is in Christ. Stop trying to be something you're not. Be a Christ follower. John 1, 12. But as many as receive him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. You want to know who you are? You are the very sons and daughters of the almighty creator God. Don't forget that. You don't need to worry about making people like you. You don't need to run around trying to be something you're not. Your identity is in Christ. And if you are in Christ, you are sons and daughters of God. You know, Ruling and reigning one day at the right hand. Why? Christ. We, are, we have his inheritance. We literally are in Christ. We don't need to make pretend we're something we're not. Our identity comes through Christ. If you are a child of God, your identity is in Christ. You are forgiven. You are holy. You are blameless you are no longer a sinner we've talked about this phrase I, i've heard it i've even used it we are just sinners saved by grace listen that is a false thought process here is why because the bible calls us saints and saints are called to be holy why because he is holy if we run around giving ourselves permission, we're just sinners, then of course we're going to live out of our brokenness. But if we remind ourselves, I am a saint called to walk in the Spirit, holy, blameless, without sin. Now, I'm not saying you're going to become sinless, but I am telling you this. In this world, you will sin less when you learn to walk in the Holy Spirit. First Peter chapter one, verse 13. Therefore, gird up your loins of uh, the, the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest uh, your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written be holy, for I am holy. You are a child of God. You are an heir with Christ. You are set free from that sin nature so that you can walk in the Spirit of God. You are the righteousness of God. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him Philippians 3 9 and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law the do's and the don'ts the rules and regulations but that which is through faith in Christ listen the righteousness which is from God I am no longer a sinner I am a saint called to be holy and when I sin, it's because I'm not walking out of the Spirit. I'm walking out of the brokenness of my past. I'm walking out of the brokenness of my flesh. And that no longer belongs. No longer belongs. God has a better story. Christ has saved me. 
When I can't put my faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within me. He took up residency. There's power in that. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. How are we supposed to abound in hope? By the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in trembling. Who's writing? The Apostle Paul. What you think about that moment? Imagine the Apostle Paul showing up here on a Sunday morning. He's going to preach a message. And he's just, I'm really afraid to talk to you today. We don't view Paul that way, do we? What's he telling them? I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know what he's saying? It's not about what I said. It's about what the Holy Spirit chose to do. That's our prayer every time we meet. Holy Spirit, you know we got a message here, but you do whatever you want to do. It's another reason we never finish our messages. <laughs> if the Holy Spirit wants to do something, let's let him do it. Because he's at work. He's working. Now we've got our chart filled in. Let's add some quick descriptive words, shall we? Well, that doesn't work. Complete. complete what god has done for me what christ has accomplished for me out of god's great love and christ's sacrifice i am now complete in him and i have been given complete forgiveness oh but you don't know what i've done no 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 god knows you've been forgiven your sins have been completely forgiven colossians 2 verse 6 as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and this empty deceit according to the tradition of men. He's talking about the church, the religious people, the good people, the people who make the list of the do's and the don'ts and the rules and regulations. That's the traditions of men according to the basic principles of the world. Now, the world will tell you what a Christian is supposed to be. Yeah? You're a Christian. You're not supposed to do that. And not according to Christ. For in Him, who? Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. In Him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the putting off the body of sins of the flesh by circumcision of Christ. Literally, he's cut it all off. Buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead and you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh. He has made alive together in him, not partially alive. That'd be strange. He has made you alive. having wiped out the handwriting requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. You know what the requirement he's talking about? Sin requires a payment of death. For the wages of sin is death. And it's taken it out of the way. 
having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. You know what he's saying? <laughs> Take care of it. All of it. Not some of it. All of it. Past, present, future. There's one other word we can add here. True. True. We try to build our identity in all kinds of things. It's easy to say, hey, I am an engineer. And that's our identity. I'm a real estate agent. I'm a woodworker. I'm a pastor. I'm a teacher. We build our identities on things that are not necessarily bad. But this is who we are. Let's be that first. That is our true identity. How about this? Do you think God has anything that's going to limit his power? Then why do we get so stressed when things happen in life? Why do we worry so much? Deuteronomy put it this way. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord, your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. You know what's in the case? In this case, the people are like, we're going to die. No, don't fear about that. God's got this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Job 36, 22. Behold, God is exalted by his power. He teaches, or who teaches like him? Um, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I ask or think, according to the power that works in in us to him be glory in the church by christ jesus to all generations forever and ever amen god is not limited the power that is within us that's holy spirit he is not limited can i do one more word for you We don't have time to unpack this, but I'll give you the gist. This is where most of us stop. God loves me. He sent his son for me. He died for me, and I've accepted salvation, and that's all I need. I heard one pastor describe it like this. Have you ever met anyone who goes to the mall? And from here, it's like 45 minutes, right? You go to the mall, you get to the mall, you get in the door of the mall, and you hang out there the rest of the day. What a nice door I have. Wow, there's air conditioning in this place. Look, there's a directory of the mall, but I'm not leaving the door. That's how we treat salvation. We get saved, and we're happy with that. We all stop there. How dare that church hold me accountable? We all stop there. How dare they have expectations of me? We all stop there. You want me to go to a Bible study? We all stop there. God has a journey for you that is unbelievable. God has a story for you that will not be rivaled by anything you can imagine. Unfortunately, many of us stop right there. God's for me. He sent his son for me. I'm saved now. That's it. Good. No. That is the beginning of your journey. That is the beginning of your story. He has so much more for you. So very much more. But don't get stuck at the door. Yeah, everything keeps coming back to salvation. That's absolutely there. It's a foundation. But that's just the beginning, not the end. It's the beginning, not the full journey, because God has so much for you. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes for just a moment.